there is still one more root code that's about to arrive. And it's a pleasure and honor to welcome you. Uh, and this is, I think, uh, we're going on a whole decade of these events that we've been having with the Ritko family. And I guess I just wanted to first express our gratitude to Sam and Lucille Ritko and their beloved children, who are right here in the front row. And I will give them an opportunity to say a word or two if they would like uh, before Brad gets started this afternoon. But um, Rachel, David, Jonathan, thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. It really makes a difference for us to be able to be present and to be thoughtful about the importance of psychoanalytic concepts and the tradition that we have here at the Child Study Center to move forward looking at issues of development and working together to understand more clearly the unconscious mind of our patients. And let me just quote uh, Sam for a moment. Uh, I was looking around for something that I might be able to share with you. And I'll come back to this quote uh, just at the end of my brief comment. Um, so this annual event and their untiring efforts to focus our attention on the importance of psychoanalytic approaches to understand, and here's the quote from Sam, the rich and baffling phenomenon of human psychic life. So that, that's sort of classic as uh, Sam but I'll come back to the entire quote at the end of the presentation. Um, so that's a quote from a piece that Sam actually authored back in 1964, before I even arrived here at the Child Center. In any case, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I did promise Brad I would be brief, um, but we're honored today to actually welcome home Brad Peterson. has been a friend and colleague for at least the last 30 years. And when I say home, I do mean home. And what I mean by I mean home is that, believe it or not, it was on Winchester 1 that he met his wife. <laughs> believe it or not, his two older children were born in Yale New Haven Hospital. So he knows this place pretty well. Um, of course, as you'll see, He's also quite a remarkable individual, world-renowned for his expertise with regard to brain imaging and what's happening in the brain, and neuroscience with real expertise in the structure and functioning of our developmental processes that uh, underlie brain development. And I guess I was just so pleased to see and talk with him a bit yesterday about one of the goals and focuses that he has, which is actually if we understand all of this a bit better, we actually may be in an excellent position to move ahead with prevention. So we can talk a bit more about that at the end. Uh, Brad is also a fully trained child and adult uh, psychoanalyst, and his journey of discovery, both in neuroimaging and psychoanalysis, began here at Yale. And although if we take a full developmental perspective, we'd have to say well, it was enriched by his time at Yale, and it may have been given some sort of degree of focus and impetus as well. But he trained at the Western New England Institute of Psychoanalysis, and I guess one of the wonderful things was that there was an event there last night, which is typically part of what's been done with the ritual lectures. And I'd like to call out Joni Pohl for organizing it. I'd also like to call out Michael Garland for the wonderful case presentation that he made. But it was just great to see Brad in action as a supervisor uh, and in his role as a psychoanalyst. It was really just great. So um, I would have to say that Brad had the good fortune to learn from and interact with Sam on a daily basis during his time here at Yale. He was one of his supervisors and uh, a wonderful colleague. And uh, of course, Sam was here at the Child Study Center for at least six decades. And he was also one of the uh, supervising and training analysts at Western New England. Um, but it was a wonderful occasion last night, so thank you. And I think as I reflect on it, Sam would have been so pleased to have been there last night. Uh, and it's quite clear to me in this ever-changing and deeply interconnected world that Sam continues to live on in the hearts of minds of so many of us, including Brad. So Brad, we're looking forward to learn from you and your pioneering efforts to understand the functioning of our unconscious and conscious minds as we interact with our patients, also with our family, with our colleagues, and with our friends. 
But before turning the floor over to you, let me just finish that quotation from Sam because it's a perfect introduction to your presentation. Psychoanalytic theory has to be multidimensional to articulate constructs, propositions, and concepts on various levels of abstraction in order to embrace the rich and baffling phenomenon of the human psychic life. Premature systemization would have had a strangling effect on a theory whose strength lies in the complexity which can be uh, encompassed under its general propositions in its being an open system and its firm roots in observation. And if, of course, since we're here at the Child Study Center, I would say not only its firm roots in observation, but in direct interaction with our patients and certainly with our child analytic cases, play. So with that, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Peterson, but it's a great honor to introduce you, and thank you for coming out. Jim, thank you so much. It's just remarkably kind of you to uh, be here for that introduction. It's also remarkably kind of so many friends and colleagues and uh, supervisors, Dr. Carlson, uh, uh, who've been able to make it here today. It just means uh, the world to me. And, you know, it, just to say that this is, you know, home or home-like is, is certainly a euphemism, but it's also deeply, deeply true, and I feel very much as though I, I grew up here, spent you know, about a dozen years here, and, um, you know, the relationships, those never end, even if we don't see each other very much. And so many times I, I, I miss being here and sometimes wish, you know, I had stayed or regretted leaving because it really is home. But everything happens for a reason, I believe that very deeply and fundamentally. And so uh, I think some of the reason will be maybe evident in the talk. I just wanted to mention, uh, Jim mentioned that I was uh, supervised by Sam. I had a really good fortune, both as a fellow for about a, a year, and then as a candidate at Western New England. He was a supervisor in a 15-year-old, I guess, when I began the case, a boy with OCD and sociopathy. And I never thought this boy would, would stick in analysis ever, ever, that he was coming all the way up from Darien five times a week, if possible. Uh, and Sam said, you know, you never know. Give it, a, give it a try. You know, what's there to lose? And I would say it was life transforming for that boy and, and also for me. Uh, and Sam supervised that. Um, I would say as a fellow, I would, for the first few months, I was pretty convinced Sam didn't like me too much. Um, I'm not sure. We, I just didn't feel it. And then gradually through the year, I think one reason why is that he also ran the um, long-term psychotherapy seminar. And, and Sam, as you, for those of you who were supervised by him, you know, he, his mantra was always surface to death. Start at the surface, start at the surface. I, what is that? <laughs> what, at, clinically and psych, psychodynamic, you know, and psychotherapy, what is that? And, uh, I, and it took me, I would say, the next four or five years of supervision with Sam to figure out what that meant. And, uh, and I would say it's informed every, every minute of clinical work that I do. It also very, very much has influenced this, along with the training at Western New England, which is an absolutely fabulous experience for me. Um, so this represents a, a, a synthesis of two different aspects of my life, for sure, that of analytic training and neurobiological research. And, um, and let me just tell you about the <coughs> origin. So I knew very much I wanted to, to train in psychoanalysis. It's one of the reasons I came to Child Study Center, because of its support and, and interest in, in the supervisors here. Um, but I also was here in a research fellowship, two-year research fellowship and two-year clinical. And towards the end of that first uh, two-year research fellowship, I bought a condo out in Bradford on the water. And I was sitting around pool, literally on a sunny summer afternoon. Probably had a beer, although I'm not positive of that. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, how, how can I, what do I want to do in my scientific career that I think would really be important and that would, would be groundbreaking in some way? And, and, I, and I was thinking, well, so fMRI had just been invented. It had been focusing on 
co higher cognitive functions like you know, math and language and that sort of stuff. I thought, well, that's interesting, but it doesn't really get to the heart of really what makes us human in terms of relationships. And, 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 and is there some way of tapping into the hundred years or so of what we've learned about mental functioning, internal life, from psychoanalysis and study that with imaging? And I thought, well, how in the world can I do that? And, and you'll, you'll hear more about some of the paradigms we've developed, but at the time I was studying Tourette's syndrome, and I thought, is there anything with Tourette's that could relate to that? And I was thinking, well, you know, Jim had been working on these uh, uh, premonitory urges, the urges to move and to have a tick. And then think about clinically, well, you know, it's so hard to control. These kids try to suppress it all day long. It's like you've got this balance between drive and, and impulse and then the control of it. And that sounded kind of psychodynamic-like to me. And, and even though it's in a motor domain, it's, you know, it's drive and, and it's regulation that's so critical to mental life. And, and thinking through that, I thought of the first fMRI paradigm in Tourette's, which was tick suppression. So allowing them to tick in the, in the scanner and then suppressing it to see what controls ticks, at least volitionally. And you'll see a little bit of that in the talk. But that was the very first sort of moment of trying to integrate them. And I would say that through my career, about 90%, maybe more, of all the work that I've done taps into some element of psychoanalytic thinking or construct, has been informed by it or inspired by it, motivated by it. And that's what I've chosen to study um, using brain imaging. So, so um, I would say that, you know, when I think of, well, what do we really think of core analytic constructs? What are they? And how can we study them scientifically and neurobiologically? So those core constructs are still debated, um, somewhat surprisingly. However, most would agree that they include the existence of drives and affects, so impulses, desire, things that make, make us want to do things, particularly drives toward pleasurable aims and away from unpleasurable ones. So the pleasure principle, according to Freud. Second is regulation of those drives, the drive derivatives. And that implies intersecting conflict. It, 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 it um, entails it. So if, you're, if you have an impulse to strike out because you're angry, something puts the brake on. It's either you know, fear of retaliation or some moral prescription, or uh, you know, what would my parents say? You know, there are things that come to to bear, to regulate that impulse. And so it's the regulation of, of drive derivatives. Transference, I, I think we all know it. I'm not going to have to define it for you, but that's a core construct. The existence of unconscious processes. Not everything is, pro is conscious. Some things, in fact, some very important aspects of mental life occur outside of conscious awareness. And then fifth, the, the, these processes are determined by developmental processes, that, um, that the history of the organism is essential, that both constitution and experience matter in informing each of these other processes and constructs. So the talk is going to be broken into five sections. Each one of those, I'm going to give you some idea of paradigms that we've used to try to access those constructs. It doesn't mean that they're perfect. I'll leave them up to you to decide how, how well we succeed in that or not. It's impossible to study those constructs um, directly using current neuroscience techniques because really you can't uh, measure brain activity in patients during psychoanalytic sessions. Even if you could, nothing would be controlled and that's the ultimate basis of, of an experiment. Nevertheless, there have been developed mo experimental models that are relevant to the study of these psychoanalytic constructs. And these models simplify the field of variables. So that's an essential element of experiment. Right? You have to be able to simplify the field to say we're studying this variable, not these other hundred. <coughs> and you have to be able to control that variable at will. It's the other <coughs> element of scientific method to manipulate that variable. And all scientific experiments are really somewhat artificial. They're never quite exactly mirroring the real world. 
and hopefully we approach reality progressively throughout lots of experiments. So this first uh, area is drives affects and the pleasure-unpleasure continuum. So lots of papers, including quite large papers using this construct I'm going to talk about. Uh, the last was in large sample of autistic people and healthy controls, looking at these processes um, across disorders. So it's interesting that Freud never, at least in, by my reading, never fully elaborated a comprehensive theory of emotions. Instead, he developed a theory of biological drive. He posited that all living organisms seek to maximize pleasurable experiences and minimize unpleasurable ones. It's a reasonable thesis. It seems fairly face, face valid. Drives for him were motivated impulses toward action, blind impulses. And motives, and motive is the etymological root for emotions. And so it seems like this is the closest that he came to articulating a theory of emotions, is his theory of drives. <coughs> so the reigning paradigm for the study of emotions in contemporary neuroscience is called the discrete emotion theory. It's maybe uh, uh, giving way a little bit to the subsequent model I'm going to talk about, but this still is the reigning paradigm. And I'm just going to summarize it by saying that it's one emotion maps to a specific, discrete, relatively independent neural circuit in the brain. So fear leads to the first neural circuit, just directly, and it doesn't necessarily interact very much with these others. Pleasure leads to a second, pain to a third, and so forth. So again, relatively discrete, independent circuits. The problem with this, there are many problems. We've written critiques of this. Others have as well. No one can agree on what those basic emotions are, or how many there are, or how they create other emotions. Presumably, these are like atoms that, in various combinations, give rise to new molecules and new properties. But no one really knows. There are lots of other problems with this model. There's a competing model, it's called the affective circumflex model. It has a long history. I would say that our, our main collaborator in this, Jim Russell from uh, uh, Boston College, was the main, not the, I would say the main proponent, the main developer of the theory. And it, it goes something like this. It's really remarkably elegant in my opinion, remarkably. So you've got a lot of different emotions that in folk psychology we can name. You're upset, anxious, angry, tense, alert, and so forth. You can read them there. This theory posits that there are essentially two dimensions, maybe more, but two primary dimensions that, the, that are, represent neurophysiological systems that are always active. Every instant of your life, they're active to varying degrees. They can be more or less active. One of these neurophysiological systems is is a sensation of that something's either pleasant or unpleasant. Or, in various terminology, it can be something that makes you approach it or avoid it, and so forth. Um, orthogonal to that, independent of it, is a second system that's, that makes you sit up and take notice. People call it different things. It can be activation, deactivation. It can be arousal. But basically, it makes you sit up, take notice, and, and, and you're in a state of alertness. So these are two independent uh, physiological systems. And in various, they're always active. And in their various combinations, produce different underlying physical sensations in your body and your mind. So if you are in the unpleasant side of this and fairly activating, you may be anxious or angry or tense. If you're activated, but on the more pleasant side, you could be excited, elated, happy. Lower left quadrant, it's unpleasant, but, but low activity, low arousal. You may be sad, depressed, bored. And pleasant, but low is relaxed, serene, contented. Now, these blur imperceptibly one into another. <coughs> and what we label them is really based on our current experience. So if you're aroused, and, and your, your heart's beating and, and, and your stomach's sort of uh, upset, 
and, and, um, and someone's coming at you a gun, well, you'd say, well, that's fear. On the other hand, if, if you have the same sensations and you're riding a roller coaster, you'd say, well, that's excitement. So there's a, a little bit of cognitive overlay that tells you what, what specific emotion and, 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 and a labeling that, of, of that emotion. So Freud recognized clearly the pleasant unpleasant continuum. He was less, so less about the uh, arousal or activation continuum orthogonal to it. So um, really briefly, people using the discrete emotion theory, meaning one emotion, one system, have typically approached imaging the following way, fMRI imaging, functional imaging. So let's take one picture on the left, say we want to study that emotion, and they compare neural activity when you're watching that as opposed to watching the, the picture on the right. And you do lots of examples of that, and you essentially compare neural activity between those two, and you say, okay, that little dot in blue is what supports that emotion on the left, or at least the difference between them. It's a subtraction paradigm. The problem with discrete emotion theories, this is another problem with it, but especially for use in fMRI in these uh, two level subtractions, is what is that motion, the emotion on the left? So I look at that and I see disgust. You know, she's, she's like smelling something awful or, you know, it's just, just something rancid. It's, it's terrible. On the right, I'm not sure what that is. It kind of looks like surprise to me. Um, Maybe in anticipation, somewhat excited anticipation. Sometimes I think he looks constipated. <laughs> these, these are two pictures from the canonical system that lots and lots of immigrants have used, cognitive neuroscientists, <coughs> and they say everyone labels those essentially the same. Well, I can tell you they don't because I don't, so, because the canonical labels are anger on the left and fear on the right. And so you can think of, if you think of the circumflex model, you don't have a context in which to label those. And there's a lot of ambiguity in terms of what those faces and represent in terms of underlying emotions. So using the circumflex model as our base, we, we take a much more uh, direct approach. We show participants lots and lots of emotional faces. And we simply ask them at, after each face to rate their subjective experience of that face, what emotions their feeling and, and, those, the, and the pictures are representing. So they rate a, their own arousal, how much it makes them sit up and take notice, feel alert, or how pleasant or unpleasant it is. So the two dimensions of, of the circumplex. And, and then we correlate those ratings with neural activity, which is measured using the bold signal the MRI. And so it's literally a correlation. It's called a parametric analysis rather than a subtraction. And so here on the, in, the, in the graph, we have neural activity on the y-axis and a valence rating on the x-axis. And we simply identify points in the brain where there's a significant correlation in that person. So now we can say, what are the neural systems for valence in that person and arousal in that person using their own subjective ratings, not whether they're accurate or not in labeling it, right? So with that said, there are multiple ways of approaching this in terms of stimulus. So we've done this with words. So they can simply read words and, uh, and experience or try to experience that emotion, anger, fear, happy. Another is emotional faces, which is very typical, I was just showing you. And then mood induction. So there's a lot of cognitive evaluation with words and faces. We wanted to get people into the, the experience, and so these are sort of examples of each of these. Anger is, you're waiting in line at the bank when someone cuts in front of you, you point this out to him and he replies, too bad. And, and you sort of think of that, get into that experience, and, and feel that emotion, whatever it is, without us labeling it. Fear, imagine someone's holding a gun to your head. <coughs> Happy, imagine you've just won the lottery. So we have lots and lots of these examples, surveying the whole circumplex. And then we map it to brain systems. And so these regions in purple are the prototypical limbic system. So you see the amygdala, hippocampus there and back. They all connect to the fornix and the cingulate gyrus. Uh, right there, it's labeled. Uh, 
canonical emotion system. There are lots of other you know, brain regions that interact with these and that are also likely to be active. And so this is what we have, have seen in one study. We've published a, a lot in this. This is using, using the mood induction task, as I said. And when we use all stimuli, um, they're, they're fairly modest correlations and, I, and regions that we identify using all stimulus types. In the middle column, when we sort out those stimulus, those stimuli that involve people in the paradigm when we're generating emotions, so we call those interpersonal stimuli, we get much, much more powerful activation. And you can see it in frontal lobe, parietal, um, temporal lobe. These are primarily attentional systems in the brain. The purple means that it's an inverse correlation so that we have more neural activity when they're rating the, their mood and, and experience more negatively, more unpleasant. So it makes you sit up and take, uh, attend to it, if you will, um, attentionally. And then non-interpersonal stimuli are very weak. They don't activate these, this system very much at all. So there, and, and that's a very significant difference between the interpersonal and non-interpersonal stimuli. So what it says that, at least in the emotional domain, when it involves people in the stimulus, it, you get much more powerful brain activity uh, correlating with valence and arousal. These are the arousal correlates. And again, it's very, very much, much stronger for interpersonal than for non-interpersonal stimuli. In the interpersonal, you see these regions in the middle of the brain. So these are sections kind of parallel to the floor in a standing person. I really wish I had a pointer, but this would be the forehead and back of the head, sides of the head. And so it's this middle portion of the brain up here. That's the cingulate gyrus. It was on the cartoon I pointed out. That's part of the limbic system. And it's also part of these other uh, cortical regions and also amygdala and hippocampus in the bottom slice. So arousal seems to get the, the, the limbic system much more juiced up. Uh, so the more arousing the stimulus is in the mood induction technique, and, and especially in the interpersonal, do, interpersonal domain, you get the, the limbic activation. So with this first construct, that was the most complicated of them, because most people haven't heard of the circumplex model. And, and it's really a, a very powerful model. So increasingly unpleasant emotions increasingly engage attentional systems in the brain. Increasingly arousing emotions activate limbic portions, especially of the anterior cingulate cortex. And these correlations are true for interpersonal, but not necessarily for non-interpersonal emotions. At least much more powerful when people are involved. Still unknown is what the neural basis is when non is for non-interpersonal emotions. We really couldn't couldn't get much out of that, at least with this paradigm. And what systems acted in common between both interpersonal and non-interpersonal emotions. Okay, the second construct is the regulation of drives in interpersonal conflict. I'm not sure what you said there. I would say that this is a, a very massive part of the portfolio of my lab's work and, and this historical work. If you really want to summarize vast amounts of neuroscience research, both animal and clinical uh, and human applied research, we can simplify it saying that the, the regions that control impulses, um, involve portions of the frontal lobe here that funnel down directly to the basal ganglia here with caudate here in the lenticular nucleus and then flow back up again through the thalamus to the cortex. And those frontal regions are especially powerful. So most people know that frontal cortex it, you know, is intimately involved. It's a central executor of the brain. But it also it does so by, by regulating uh, impulses. The rotating structures on the right just show you further the, the caudate in purple, reticular nucleus in green, and globus pallidus nestled inside in light blue. So one of the earliest uh, fMRI <coughs> paradigms that we developed in the lab is for this task called the Stroop interference, word color interference task. 
Most of you who've read a neuropsych report or ever done neuropsych testing know what this is. It's a classic, uh, very, very widely used task um, clinically. We've used it as an experimental, experimental model for self-regulatory control and interpsychic conflict. So again, I said, you know, we need paradigms that allow experimental control of variables. And you, you can see whether this is a, is a reasonable model or not for conflict. But here's the task. Most of you know it. So we have two sets of stimuli, broad sets. One is congruent, the other is incongruent. In the congruent task, we show, well, in both tasks, we're showing colored words. The task is always to name the visual color, not what the word reads. Name the visual color. So here it's red, blue, yellow, green. You can do that really quickly and easily without error. Then interspersed among those, we'll present those that are incongruent. So there you have to name green, yellow, blue, red. And even there, after many years, I still have to slow down in order to do it properly. So reaction times lengthen because it's harder. You tend to make more errors, although mostly you don't. You just have to slow down. So you get the task right. Um, but why is that slower and why is it harder? It's because word reading becomes highly, highly automated by about second and third grade. So very, very early on, it, 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 you're much faster at reading than you are at naming colors. No one knows why. It's just an empirical fact. You'd think that somehow, biologically, it might be more important to name colors, but no. At least for human species, reading apparently is, is, is faster and more fluid. So you've got one impulse, if you will, which is to read. That's what you want to do. That's your, your uh, uh, proclivity. The experimenter, however, wants you to name the color, to do the less automatic task. So you have to put the brakes on the automatic task in order to do the less automatic one. And in fact, you have this inherent conflict between the stimuli. You have conflict between reading <coughs> and naming. So you, there they're fused with green fused in red. Green fused in the, the word that reads red. So that is, I thought, a model of intersecting. Of, it's a model of conflict. There's no question about that. Cognitive neuroscientists would agree with that. Whether it's intersect conflict, you can argue about that. But at least it's a model, and it's a way to begin. So we image people when they're doing the congruent task. We image them when they're doing the incongruent. We compare the two um, sets of data one to another. And it's a beautifully designed task because the words are exactly the same. The colors are exactly the same. The task is the same. The instructions are the same. The only thing that differs is how the colors and words come together, the conflict that's present, and then the, the need to sort them out. So, so we were the first to, to publish this. And, um, and we had trouble getting it published because no one believed it for various reasons. It turns out, you know, um, it's now a classically used paradigm. We still use it a lot. And what do you see when people are sorting out conflict? You see in red a lot of activation in the portions that you would imagine for sorting out conflict and regulating drives. So frontal regions, this is singulate, frontal, singulate, frontal, massive, right? Uh, basal ganglia, basal ganglia here. So frontal and striatal systems that are regulating impulses and conflict. One of the things that made this paper hard to publish was these blue regions here, here, and here. We just reported everything. Before that, people would only report uh, increases in activity. Blue represents decreases in activity. And when it turns out <coughs> when you're regulating conflict and doing higher order cognitive tests, you have to shut off those blue regions. Those are sort of mind-wandering regions of the brain. They're called default mode systems, and you have to shut those off in order to perform tasks properly. If you don't shut them off, you, you, uh, you don't perform very well. So we've um, published scores of papers using that task, looking at normal development from kids through senescence, ADHD, OCD, Tourette's, bulimia, bipolar disorder, major depression, autism, and stuttering. So um, 
what that has taught us, in a nutshell, is that you may have underlying symptoms of, of, of any kind, but what seems to be disordered in each of these illnesses is regulatory processes. And very often, the more disordered the regulatory process in these frontal striatal systems, the more severe the illness and the more responsive it is to interventions that improve that regulation. A second paradigm for studying impulse control, I mentioned this, this, this was the one I cooked up by the Brantford Pool side <laughs> with the help of uh, Sam Adams, I suspect. Um, so this is looking at the ability to suppress motor and vocal tics. So you know that both motor and vocal tics primarily affect, affect musculature of face, neck, and shoulders. Before these tics is a premonitory urge, Jim was seminal in, in first describing these things. These are sensory motor impulses, a sort of discomfort, almost like an itch in that region that you need to scratch by moving that region. And when you move that, that motor unit, it brings a little bit relief. It's very temporary though, because very soon after that urge builds again. So it's a cycle of <coughs> tension, performance, and relief. That tension is a drive. And kids, when that, when that drive is, and that, that urge is building, very often try and need to suppress it, especially during school activities. So we just had, um, this was a study of adults. It's this, it's, we find the same thing in kids. So adults we bring in and we allow them to tick in the scanner. So again, it's faces. It's not, they're not having big bodily movements. We had to screen out those people. So small amplitude ticks of their face um, musculature. And we would let them tick for about 30 seconds. Then we'd give them command and say, um, inhibit. And then they would shut them down. And they became, adults are very good at that. They can shut them down completely. They go back and forth between those two. And then we compare neural activity between inhibiting and letting them go. So inhibiting produces increases in activity in frontal cortex, as you'd expect, also anterior temporal, a little bit of parietal. Those are attentional systems that interact also with the basal ganglia. Here, uh, we're seeing in blue that it's shutting off basal ganglia. And we think that's because that's where the ticks are originating from. And so when you inhibit them with these frontal striatal circuits, you can shut down the activity that's producing the ticks. That was the first fMRI study, I believe, in Tourette syndrome. So um, thanks to Jim and a lot of other collaborators here, Bob King and just so many people. We were successful in publishing lots of studies from anatomical imaging to functional, lots of different ways of studying ticks and their, and their control, and scores and scores of papers, I would say. This is the, the bottom line summary of, I think, what we learned about the control of the drive to tick. <coughs> so tick suppression activates from a cortex, quite massively, actually. So you can imagine when these kids are trying to attend to things in school, it's very hard because all their attentional capacities and productivity is, is absorbed doing that. That generates a plastic response in frontal cortex and hippocampus. If they can generate that, if they're unable to generate it on the left side, it leads to smaller volumes of those structures. And we see that especially in adults. And the smaller those volumes, the more severe and persistent their symptoms are. And that increases activation of those structures. So they're small, they're sort of dysfunctional, and they've got to generate more activity in order to maintain task performance. Other people, for reasons, so we don't know why some can't generate that change in frontal cortex, and others can. But if you can, you have larger volumes because it, it's, the frontal cortex is literally changing in response to this experiential demand of constant stimulation. And it increases in hypertrophies, we believe, leading to fewer symptoms and normal activation patterns. 
that are indistinguishable from controls. So this idea of plasticity in the frontal cortex and in these frontal striatal regulatory pathways is really, really critical. So the drive is important, the impulse to have a kid, but what seems to be really dominant in the clinical outcome and the neurobiology is in the regulatory portion of this system. You know, this is maybe, maybe the most centrally relevant uh, portion of the talk. I may skip this, and if there's time, I'm going to come back to it, only because this takes a little bit to get through, and I want to make sure I leave enough time for, for the last two portions. So if, if that's okay with you, I'm going to do this. So, um, the importance of conscious and unconscious processes in discriminating. So we took this one head on with collaborators at SUNY Purchase. Um, all of, so this is looking at conscious and unconscious processing of a phobic stimulus. Most of you know that conscious exposure and desensitization are the mainstays of CBTs for phobias and for fears. So if you expose someone to their fear, object or feared stimulus, and they hang in there, kind of white knuckle it through, eventually they, they learn that it's, that it's tolerable and their, and their fear subsides. That's the basis of CBT in essence. Recent studies, however, with uh, these collaborators have shown that exposure to the phobic stimulus outside of conscious awareness, presenting it subliminally, if you will, produces a greater attenuation of the fear response, so it's more helpful in reducing fear behaviors to the feared object, much more so than conscious presentation of the same stimulus. So the question for us was, what's the basis in the brain for that effect? What possibly could be responsible for that? So this is the first of two studies. I'm only going to show this one. The others um, just been submitted. So we took a group of spider-phobic people, college-age folks, and a group of healthy natural controls. And uh, to each group, we presented two kinds of stimuli. One was subliminally presented. Another was consciously presented, superliminal. What, what makes something subliminal <coughs> is the duration of presentation. So. To, for them to be unaware that they have seen a phobic stimulus. Here it's a spider. You present for 33 milliseconds, and then immediately afterwards, you have this masking stimulus, just a set of letters, an array of letters. And this is presented for a long time. So all they're conscious of seeing is this array of letters. They don't even, they don't even know that the spider stimulus is there. In a separate run, we can present present this for a longer time, for 117 milliseconds, and, um, and then follow it by the same masking stimulus. And they will be aware of seeing the spider, and they can name it. And so after each one of these, we have them rate their fear experience and so forth. Um, and so in the phobics, this is only the phobics, I'm sure, <coughs> for simplicity. This is when they're consciously aware of the stimulus. And this is when it's subliminally presented. Let's, let's say it's unconsciously presented, but you'll forgive the, the glossing on the terms here. Um, so when they're aware of it, you see a lot of visual cortex, cortex activation. You even see that when, when they're unaware, uh, which is interesting, but it's more powerful when they're consciously aware of it, which is, makes sense. You see a little bit of frontal activation. You see these regions turn off. We can talk about that later. But the difference here is when they're unaware, there's a, a system that comes on much more powerfully. In fact, you don't even see it when they're aware of it. And it's much more frontal and then striatal. Much more powerful activation. But here again, you can see it. Much more powerful than here. And much more frontal activation. This is a map comparing those two statistically. So all I'm saying is that those are statistically significant differences. So it's interesting that um, 
there, you have less visual stimulation, uh, and you, they're not aware of seeing their fulvic stimulus, and you see frontal and striatal activation very much more powerfully than when they're consciously aware of it. Why that is, we can theorize and wax eloquent about it, but it's an empirical fact. And then the more that they activate those systems, the more they're able to approach a live tarantula after the experiment, and the bigger the reductions in their fear ratings. That also seems to turn off activity in the amygdala, which is one of the fear centers of the brain. So these regulatory systems seem to come online much more readily when they're not consciously aware of the phobic stimulus. This, an interesting twist, the same experiment in healthy controls um, looks much more like this. So, all, so when they're consciously aware, they have more visual processing, so the controls do too, but they also have much more frontal and striatal activation. So the fact that the phobics activate those frontal striatal systems here when they're unaware is very specific to them means it has to be, this isn't just any stimulus, it has to be your own sort of phobic stimulus. Right? So this is another area of work looking at developmental underpinnings is the fifth construct. And I begin with a quote from Freud, um, not simply to pay homage, but, but this is, I think, a brilliant well, it could be contemporary for sure. Neurosis will always produce its greatest effects on constitution and experience work together in the same direction. Where the constitution is a marked one, it will perhaps not require the support of actual experiences, while a great shock in real life will perhaps bring about a neurosis even in an average constitution. So this is um, a, a, a fantastic statement and very prescient about uh, constitution and experience. And um, you know, if you've got, the, you know, cards are really stacked against you, constitution can reign. Uh, if you have a decent hand but a terrible experience, traumatic experience, that can reign. But on average, it's going to be a balance between the two. I would say that summarizes most of contemporary uh, pathophysiology. So this is one way we approach studying and trying to disentangle what is constitution, meaning what you bring into the world biologically with you, versus what experience will add to it or mitigate to it, how it interacts with that constitutional vulnerability. <coughs> so these are individuals, both kids and adults, who are at either high or low risk for developing depressive disorder. This is working with Myrna Weissman, who was at Yale. Um, actually, she was a mentor of Jim's and, uh, and a colleague of mine for a long time. Um, she moved to Columbia, and so shortly after I moved to Columbia, I approached her about trying to image this sample. So let me ex explain the sample uh, first. So she ascertained in and around New Haven a, a set of very, very chronically ill, depressed adults in generation one. So they're over here on the left. And she also ascertained a group of community controls who were matched ethnically and, and demographically, who by their report, spouse reports, had never been depressed. She studied them and learned a lot about them. But more importantly, those adults had children in generation two. And she studied those biological offspring from childhood in, through adulthood. They also had children in generation three, and she studied those biological offspring from infancy, birth, through adulthood now. And there's a generation four beginning. So um, she was able to show in this model, in this data set, really important. First of all, that depression is familial. So if you're born into a family with depression, you have about a five-fold increased risk for developing depression in your lifetime. It tends to be earlier onset, more severe, more chronic, and more treatment resistant. So it's big lead. It also, if you make it to about age 25 and you're not sick, 
you're probably okay the rest of your life. So it really is in, in really adolescent onset. It, she also showed that, that depression in adolescence is preceded by anxiety disorders in grade school. And those anxiety disorders, especially phobias, tend to morph into depression into, by adolescence. So we imaged a lot of people in this sample, but I'm going to only show you the results from generations two and three, because what we want to know is what is transmitted in the brains of these kids through generations that set them up to becoming depressed. So we imaged 66 in generations two and three in the biological offspring, they're high risk, and 65 in the low risk group. What we did was we measured the, uh, so this is an anatomical study. We're looking at brain structure in these people. We've looked at lots of other things too. I'm just showing you brain structure. So we measured the thickness of the cortical mantle, which is on the outside of the cerebrum. It's about six millimeters thick on average. And we can measure it millimeter by millimeter throughout the brain. We bring all those brains into a single space called a template space so that I can measure that point and compare that point in me with that point in Jim, that point in Joni, and so forth. And then we have a population at each point, a population of, we can compare simply the high risk group with the low risk group statistically at each point, literally millimeter by millimeter across the surface of the brain. And so here in the left hemisphere, here's the forehead back of the head, uh, the gray represents no significant differences between the two groups. So they don't really differ very much in cortical thickness in the left hemisphere. In the right hemisphere, however, it's a massive difference. It extends from the back of the brain to the front, top to the bottom, a little sparing of the temporal cortex, but not much. So it's massive in its spatial extent. And the purple indicates that it's thinner in the high risk group. So the offspring have thinner cortices, and especially the lateral aspect of the right hemisphere, but not the left. It's also massive, not just in spatial extent, but at any single point. So any single point in the brain, of the, in the right hemisphere, is, on, it is reduced on average 30%. So it's a massive effect. In fact, it's the biggest biological effect I've seen in an imaging study. These are offspring of sick people. Now you can say, yeah, but some of those offspring in both groups had either anxiety or depression in their lifetimes. And we know who did because she followed them prospectively every five years. So it's a really rich, fabulous data set. So what do we do? We eliminated anyone who had ever been sick in their lifetime with anxiety or depression, who ever had a diagnosis. And we see exactly the same findings. They didn't, if anything, they were maybe stronger in this group, even though the <coughs> sample size was somewhat lower. So this says definitively that, what, that this biological feature of right hemisphere thinning is transmitted between generations. And it's not a consequence of having been sick. This is a vulnerability, an end of phenotype, a true end of phenotype for depression. It's not a consequence of being treated. It's not a consequence of the chronic effects of stress associated with an illness. This really seems to be a biological vulnerability. It doesn't mean that they get, get off scot-free, though. It turns out that there are some abnormalities that come along with this cortical thinning of the right hemisphere. So this is a map correlating cortical thickness at each point with a measure of memory for social stimuli. And we find these significant correlations in the right hemisphere, exactly in the same locations, but not the left. It's in the same pattern as the, as the endophenotype for risk. And it's in the direction such that the thinner, the thinner the cortex, the worse the memory for social stimuli. So it seems that when you are born into the world and you have this, this feature, you're struggling with remembering and processing social information and social relationships. We think that's probably what sets people up for becoming depressed. It is the vulnerability uh, and behaviorally and psychologically that puts them at risk here. Now, that's familial transmission of this risk. We don't know whether it's genetic in origin or whether it's environmental. So if you're born into a family with, with, this, uh, with depression, that may affect the, the architecture of your brain, the sculpting of your brain. It's entirely possible. But we know that's familial, and they come, it comes in very early. So that once we know what we're looking for, 
we can see this pattern in individual brains, and we know that it's present in the youngest kids of the same. If anything, it's even, it's even more powerful in those kids. So it's there by age six, and it seems to persist through lifetime. The last bit of data I'm going to show is a paper that was just, just published uh, recently, molecular psychiatry. So this is a different sample, but it's looking at the same measure of cortical thickness. And here we're yoking imaging to a randomized control trial of a medication. We could do the same with the psychotherapy. This happened to be a medication trial. So a group of chronically depressed people come in. They're randomized to get either the medication duloxetine or placebo. But instead of using symptom response as their outcome, we use brain imaging measures as our outcome. We image them at the beginning and at the end of the trial. And because this is randomized and controlled and blinded, just as we can say the medication produces a remission or change in symptoms, we can say the medication produces these changes in brain structure. It's a causal, very strong causal uh, argument. Just, that's, the, that's the whole point of an RCT. So everything's about experimental control. And, and I think this gives us great experimental control. So at the baseline, before they get medication, turns out chronic depression, remember these are in very seriously, severely ill people for a long time. They actually 